of us are feeling lonely out here, so let's <laughs> see if we can get the rest of the folks together. I'm sorry? Yeah, we might. You want to do that? Okay. All right. Um, Henry, would you? <laughs> <laughs> Whoever would like to volunteer? I'll call the roll. All right. Thank you. Jimenez? Perales? Cohen? Here. Carrasco? Here. Davis? Esparza? Arenas, Foley, Vice Mayor Jones, present. Mayor Lucar, and Mayhan is here. Present. Okay, we got Mayhan. I think we got five. We're still short of a quorum here. Yeah, we need one more. Let me go see if I can get someone from the back. Yeah. Nope. Oh. Okay. I think we now we have a quorum. Have a quorum. We do. All right, I'll record will reflect Councilmember Foley and Councilmember Prowls are both here. Uh, so I believe we now have seven members present. Let's go to item uh, 8.1, which is the amendment to the lease for the police vehicle and evidence warehouse. Um, there is no presentation on this item. Move approval. Second. Okay. I'm not sure what Councilman Prowls did, but he intended to make a motion of some kind. Did I not? Sorry. I did. Okay. Move there we go. Uh, and then Councilman Foley seconded it. Uh, let's go to the public and see if there are any public comments. There are no public comments. All right. Let's vote on that motion. Jimenez? Yes. Prowls? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Esparza? Arenas? Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, 8.3 are actions related to the grant agreements for multiple homelessness programs for the next fiscal year. There is no presentation here is that right lee yes. oh, there, there was supposed to be a presentation i'm not sure where staff is do we know yeah. lee yeah i'm texting them right now there is a presentation um well we, we can skip it if they're not here okay we could consolidate this with the public hearing on the other action plan so why don't we and we're just about at the end anyway yeah. the, the land use consent item that has been deferred is that correct it's just 10.2 Oh, there's 10.2. So you can go to 10.1. Yeah, why don't we... Um, so do 10.1 from consent. Okay, let's go to 10.1, which is land use consent calendar. That's, I'll move approve the consent calendar. Second. All right, let's go to the public, see if there's any comment on 10.1, the land use consent item. Gene Adams. This is regarding the property on 155 Burnell Road. Gene, you're unmuted, but we're not hearing you. Yes, Gene is here. Gene Adams. Hello. Hello. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Hi. Yeah, we're we're hearing public comment for the item relating to the property at 155 Burnell Road. Okay. Well, I'm kind of waiting for that property at 1371 Coozer Road. Uh, I don't think we have that on the agenda today. Do you know when it will be on the agenda? Uh, no, but you're welcome to talk, uh, speak during uh, our open our uh, public forum, uh, open okay. forum at the end of the meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay. Sai? Hello. 
go ahead yeah this is regarding nobel uh, park uh, closer to nobel park that uh, home shelter uh, uh, this one right it, uh, that's not this item uh huh this item is about 155 bernal road okay i don't have any issues for that one okay thank you Back. all right thank you let's vote on item 10.1 Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. All right. Uh, we're going to return now. I'll note that 10.2 has been deferred. So we're going to return now to 8.3, which are actions related to the grant agreements. For multiple homelessness programs, um, just staff should be here in like forty-five seconds. Okay. We'll uh, we'll take a very brief recess <laughs> for about a minute. Oh. <laughs> move approval All right there's a second. there's a motion from the vice mayor and a second from councilmember Perales. we're about to hear a presentation there's a very clear Good evening, Mayor and Council, Reagan Henninger, Deputy Director of the Housing Department. I'm joined by Kelly Hemphill, who is our Division Manager for All Things Homeless in One Day. And tonight we are talking about contracts for fiscal year 22-23. Uh, so what's before you is approximately $37 million in contracts for 24 programs serving um, homeless individuals. Uh, and it also includes our homelessness prevention programs. Um, and we are partnering with 14 different community partners um, to deliver a wide range of services. Just uh, by way of background, before I turn it over to Kelly, who's going to give you some more details about the contracts we're approving, I really did want to highlight the last um, two years of growth in terms of homeless program funding. This is a lot of funds and a lot of contracts this evening, um, and we are still um, providing grants with COVID-19 related funding. And so I think that's an important thing to highlight. It's a big swing up, but I anticipate in fiscal year 23-24, when we have expended that COVID related money, um, we'll have a big or a dip back down to a more uh, normal pace uh, in terms of funding that's available for homeless programs. And I'm gonna, turn it over to Kelly, who's going to walk you through some of the highlights of the contracts. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm, my name is Kelly Hemphill. And um, tonight, we're just going to go through all the not all of the programs, but we'll give you a little bit of background on what we're asking for approval tonight. Um, but of course, we wanted to remind everybody that we follow the three strategies outlined in the, the five-year community plan to end homelessness. And I will point out which um, programs fall under what strategy of our plan. So let's get to it. Okay. 
All right, the 24 contracts we're proposing to negotiate and execute for fiscal year 22-23 are grouped into two categories, basic need services and housing and shelter opportunities. The basic needs services will advance the goals under strategy three of the community plan to end homelessness. And three of the 10 contracts in this category are new are highlighted here in pink. While SOAR is not a new program, we are proposing to award a new agreement with Home First to expand SOAR across five very large encampments, bringing proactive outreach, case management, and connections to housing to a total of 21 encampments across San Jose. Of course, these encampments will continue to receive hygiene services in the form of portable restrooms, hand washing stations, and waste management through partnerships with an outside vendor and Beautify SJ. The supplemental memo goes into detail as to how those encampments were selected, as well as the housing department's plans to conduct a comprehensive evaluation of our outreach programs that will, that will result in a competitive procurement for a redesigned outreach service. We also use SOAR as a referral resource to house people if we know that a site is being abated. The housing department prioritizes housing individuals living in demobilized shelters and abated encampments. Also on this slide are two safe parking programs, which are also new. One is focused on services to individuals living in recreation vehicles, RVs, and one targeting families and individuals living in cars. We're currently working with our partners in Public Works to prepare the sites so that operations can begin in the fall. The other two on here are not new, and you, you probably are familiar with those programs, you have approved them before, so I won't get into detail on those. <clears throat> the contracts on this slide are amendments and have also been approved in years past. The total amount the Housing Department is proposing to spend on basic needs services is approximately $8.6 million. The housing and shelter opportunities will advance the goals under strategies one and two of the community plan to end homelessness. And two of the 14 contracts in this category are new. A new emergency interim housing program will launch with upcoming this upcoming fiscal year. The housing department is proposing to support life moves for services and operations on the new Guadalupe Emergency Interim Housing Program, also known as Lot E. The second new contract under shelter and housing opportunities is also with Life Moves to provide alternate housing options, primarily motelling for SJ Bridge participants. The coordinated SJ Bridge program couples transitional work with temporary housing options with the goal of attaining living wage employment and securing permanent housing. The total amount the housing department is proposing to spend on shelter and housing opportunities is approximately $29 million. This slide um, talks a little bit about the metrics that the housing department follows and puts in our contracts with our providers. The contracts proposed follow the local continuum of care system-wide performance benchmarks. They're all here, I won't read them all to you, but some notable metrics include 38% of individuals will exit to temporary or permanent housing through the efforts of street outreach and of course, this will apply to the SOAR program. For 30% of individuals in emergency shelter, both congregate shelter and non-congregate shelter, will exit to permanent housing. And of course, this will apply to 
emergency interim housing projects for this upcoming year. And that concludes our presentation. We're open to questions. All right, thank you. Thanks for all your hard work, Kelly and Reagan. Um, let's go to the public, specifically on this item, 8.3, actions related to the grant agreement on these homelessness programs. Tony? Jean Adams. Jean Adams. Here's it. She's muted. Um, I said at the beginning that uh, I'm very interested in the Chuck E. Cheese uh, development at 1371 Cooser Road property. Okay, so um, you had your hand up. I thought you wanted to speak about this item uh, as well. Um, raise your hand when we get to um, open forum, please. Okay. Catherine Hedges. I have a question. Why don't we have a goal of housing 100% of the participants? Is that your only comment? Um, and I don't know, it just seems like a lot of these programs, we're spending a lot of money on them, we're not getting great results, but if our goal is to only house like 30% of participants, I can see why we still have so many people living unhoused. Thank you. Gail Osmer. Hi, good evening. I don't know if I should even be saying anything because I know you're not going to be listening or accepting what I'm saying, but I don't know. None of you that sit on the city council are out there. Housing isn't out there connecting with the people. You talk about the sore sites and home first. That is a joke. You all on the city council have no idea what home first is not doing, is not doing. I'm sorry, but you're not out there. Why would you, I thought you were, I, I could be wrong, but I thought you were closing the SureSight motel, so why are you giving money? You talk about street outreach, there's nothing. I go to these camps and they laugh at me. These sore sites, has Home First been here? No, they haven't. Have been here? No, they haven't been here. It's just a travesty. I'm sorry, I, I'm babbling, but I'm so frustrated because none of you, none of you sitting on that council wants to do anything to help the unhoused. Now the city closed all the lights on Taylor. What does that mean? Oh, well, let's hurry up and get rid of people at Columbus. Let's turn the street lights off on Taylor. There's no housing. How can they connect to housing? You have um, three days a week where Whole First is sitting on their, you know what, doing nothing at Columbus. They're doing nothing at Columbus. And um, you give them millions of dollars. I'm very frustrated. So thank you for listening to me. Bye. Have a good evening. Tina Lamb. Hi, uh, good evening, and thank you for having me. Uh, just looking at the data, it seems like the emergency interim housing success rate to exit the transit into permanent housing is actually the lowest of all the program. It looks like we have more success in the rapid housing, rehousing and also the motel sheltering. Emergency interim housing is very expensive and very disruptive to the neighborhood adjacent to that because we are taking like good land open lot that undeveloped and then turn into high density housing. So I really asked the city council to consider other more successful project and programs than the, the EIH. Thank you. Please you. 
um, 2202. Hello? Yes. Uh, yeah, actually, the presentation uh, to me is not very clear, but we, we uh, heard that uh, there's one of the sites that's uh, near the Noble Elementary School and uh, Piedmont Middle School in the park. I'm, I'm so sorry, ma'am. We, we're yeah. not we're not considering that at this time. We'll be certainly hearing from many speakers on that issue during open forum, but that's a separate item. Sarah, Sarah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm hope um, I'm here to strongly oppose city's decision on building tiny whole houses for uh, with so the, if anybody with their hand up who wants to talk about tiny homes, um, put your hand down. And when we get to open forum, we'll call people who want to talk about the tiny homes. So we're going to start with the in-person speakers, and then we'll move to the, the Zoom speakers. Scott Largent. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Scott Largent. I'm uh, curious at this meeting if we have home first if they've been able to send a representative. Uh, Council Member Davis, you brought that up at the last meeting, and I think that's very important uh, for the dollar amount that's going their direction. I have never been impressed with Home First, and I am a resident out at uh, the crash zone, out at Guadalupe Gardens, that has been waiting for a safe parking program. Um, I went from several different zones, and they got my hopes up and I just needed a place to park my motorhome. Uh, Mr. Fujio, that we built a dome for behind where my RV is out there, he is still waiting also for his placement in a tiny home. Um, Rudy, which is also my neighbor out there, um, Gata, Jose, um, they're all waiting for these safe parking programs. When I looked at your list that you guys put up on this display here, it says $2 million were going towards Amigos del Guadalupe, and I believe life moves. Um, I've asked all the advocates, where is the safe RV parking programs? You heard your staff provide you guys feedback right now that they're trying to figure out the site. They're trying to figure out where it's going to be. Um, we're running out of time out here, and I think we need to show some uh, success stories, some results. Um, I've got a good group of people. Most of them actually, of all things, are sober, seniors. Um, they're ready to go somewhere. They're ready to go to a safe parking program. They're people that are not a problem. Um, I'm just wondering, are we waiting right till September 30th um, where there will be no place to go? And I worry that this is going to be like what happened out at Component, where you're going to lump a bunch of people into one area, not vet them out, and it's going to be another disaster. So thank you. Um, Laja Twiva Flinders, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, City Council. My name is Longi Twiva Flinders. I am showing up on behalf of the Lived Experience Advisory Board. Um, I just wanted to add comment for us as far as our code of conduct. We are definitely doing the most that we can to understand and really get into the code of conduct with the city council. Um, in my public opinion, just to add a few comments from the works that I've been involved in thus far. Um, so far, the maintenance portion we're okay on. Um, thank you for looking forward to granting um, the lived experience advisory board members areas that they can definitely be of help. We definitely support all the tiny homes. We support any new projects. Um, just keep us glued in. Um, abusive language is very inappropriate. Um, so we will try to conduct ourselves in a better manner. Um, just know that we are supporting with perspectives of the community in mind advocating for those that we currently have just met and those that we continue to advocate for um, while we are in our proper positions in hopes that we can continue to end homelessness for those that deserve permanent housing um, that will be part of this growing experience and will definitely add to 
more insight of what disturbance is, our conduct, our behaviors, and how we might be overlapping or disrupting each other um, so that we can continue to learn how to do the next right thing, um, sober, clean, together, up, down, all around. So that's my public comment on behalf of the Lived Experience Advisory Board. Thank you very much. Bye. Uh, hi. Hello. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, this grant seems to be very high uh, allotment of that one. Uh, what is the status about last 10 years uh, achieve something? Because last 10 years uh, allocating the amounts, right, for this homeless uh, uh, tiny homes or uh, shelters. Uh, is there any progress for that one or uh, what are the results uh, achieved uh, in the last 10 years? Uh, and I think uh, better to provide a, a better opportunities to everyone uh, because this is a country, number one country, U USA is a, a very large country and better to provide uh, for them to education or whatever it may be uh, that... Uh, uh, trainings or whatever it may be for the homeless and make them uh, more fruitful and uh, instead of spending this this much large amount on the tiny homes and all and the tiny homes and feeding them instead of that one uh, better to provide them opportunities and training them uh, at uh, every level and make them uh, self-earning that that that, way, that will uh, give a good results over the maybe around the next 20 years uh, time. Michelle? A moment. Sorry. This is Michelle Bruneau speaking. And I apologize to the council if you have more information than we are being shown in the slide presentation, but it seems like an awful lot of money without having uh, the results and an analysis of the results for past money spent and how the new programs are supposed to be different than the old programs. And unless the county has, or the, excuse me, the council has information that it's not being shared with the public showing the showing the information and how this has really been a success and how it's been keeping people off the streets, I would respect, the, I would request the court, the council not adopt the proposal. Thank you. Min Min. I'm thanking the council to that here. I look at the construction project and uh, it looks you um the board like to spend over one hundred million on those projects by yearly, but only serve the some several only hungry or some several people. I don't think this is an efficient way to deal to deal with those unresident unresident um our resident uh, um, um, poor guys. Um, why not just uh, um, help those people by vote, by give them the rental vote, by by fund them to find a job, not just uh, let let them to isolate uh, on some somewhere and uh, make them to 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 to, to be differently. I totally can understand the strategy you are working on. It totally like spend a lot of money, but get a least result. Could you reconsider the overall strategy of housing those poor guys and give them a give everyone the good chance to be start their life again? You know, those days is so, so it's a fast for everyone. Everyone needs help. Why not spend the money on a more efficient way? Thank you. 
Jerry? Thank you for your time. Uh, council members, I think we do need to have some compassion to our homeless uh, neighbors in this city as uh, this population keeps growing. However, for, uh, for the transparency to the public, this presentation should at the very least show the past 10 years of placement rate for the homeless individuals and how long they've been able to place these homeless individuals into these programs and what these overall success rate is to give just a target um, metric on what they want to do moving forward without providing any previous data or details on the success or failures of many of these programs i feel is a unjust use of taxpayer money as well as money for san jose if these programs are not increasing the placement rate of these homeless individuals then there needs to be more uh, transparency and more investigation on how to make these programs more efficient. So for the next presentation, if there is any, it, it would be uh, appreciated if we can have more data in terms of past performances of these programs, the overall placement rate, and whether or not these programs are actually helping reduce in the long term uh, the homelessness rate in San Jose. Thank you. Greeny. Greeny Van Buren. Uh, I would like to see, yeah, more detail um, strategy of how you can provide home shelters for the homeless low cost housing for the low cost uh, for the homeless people and also what are the program you have to help them train them to get a job and that's all i have to say thank you back to council all right back to the council um <clears throat> council member cohen uh, yeah, thank you, Mayor. And, and I want to first thank the staff for the uh, work with all these contracts and all, all of the things that you're doing um, on the streets with our homeless community. Um, you know, we, we, we spend a lot of time, and I know that even the mayor has made comments about our big failure is, is, is homelessness in, in this community. It certainly is, has, is still a big issue that we have to deal with. But we also ought to, like some of the commenters are asking about, talk about our successes. Um, and I want to thank you for those successes. We, Vice Mayor Jones and Councilmember Jimenez and I were at a presentation a few weeks ago with Russell Hancock from Joint Venture talking about the state of the valley. And one, of, and he was he was asked at that meeting by our Vice Mayor, who was chairing the meeting, to uh, only talk about the positive. And I, I was struck by his comment on homelessness in, in Santa Clara County and Silicon Valley, um, talking about how there's. It with, across the entire Silicon Valley, there's 12,000 homeless, and the count looks like homelessness hasn't changed in three years since the last count. Um, so it looks like a failure. But his analysis, and I think we could all agree, is that without all the work that good agencies like good departments like yours are doing, the number would be double that. We'd probably have 20 over 20,000 homeless people. And so I do just want to start with thank you for the outreach that you do in the area in the community to get people housed and and it has i think people are noticing that there are differences being made and it's definitely hard for our community who's still dealing with the effects of homelessness to understand the the quality of the work so i just want to start there um i know that i think there was a motion made although i'm not sure if that was real or not um there are two memos out there um my memo and a memo from councilmember sparza i think councilmember sparza had an issue and family issue and isn't still in the meeting. I want to be sure that both of our memos are included in the motion if possible. Um, just for context on, I, I think the context of Councilmember Sparza's memo speaks for itself. I mean, I, I, I fully support what she's asking for in hers. Um, context for my memo is a frustration that I think I also expressed last week um, about what I feel are the primary needs in District 4, but obviously in other parts of the city and some of the services that I think are being concentrated in 
certain parts of the city, but not in others. Um, and so I talk about source sites and RV parking. I think District 4, you know, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but maybe one of the highest RV parking or people parking on the streets, living on the streets district in the city. So I think it's a high priority for us to get an RV site. And I know that we included that in last week's motion. My memo this week speaks to it again and just asks for the staff to be, as resources become available, looking for ways to provide those services in our district. A big frustration for me has been that when I talk to frustrated residents who live near some of the bigger encampments in our district, what I say to them is, we have to be slow and methodical and do it right, and we're going to try to get people to accept housing options when they're available. We can't, I can't promise that people that are living there now will be gone, but what I'd like to be able to promise them is that in places where they're going to be for a while, we at least have services there, such as um, rest, restrooms, facilities, wash stations, um, and, and dumpsters, and I've told residents that I'm working to try to get those, and we still in, in the northern part of the city don't have any sites with those, with those resources. So that was the, the purpose behind the memo, and I'm hoping that, I think Councilman Perales made the motion, we'll include those two memos in the motion. I was the second, but I'm happy to support that. And I am too, so both memos. Motion's amended. All right. Uh, Council Member, in a bad Zoom day. Uh, Council Member Jimenez. Thank you. We, we all have those days, Mayor, don't worry. Um, so, uh, well, listen, I, I, I'm supportive of the, of the motion and supportive of both memos and uh, appreciate what uh, you shared in your memo, Council Member Cohen, uh, very much supportive of that. Uh, also supportive of uh, Council Member Esparza's comments in her memo, and uh, in reading her memo, it brought to mind some situations that we're dealing with in South San Jose or District 2 specifically, but I suspect it probably uh, is an issue that exists with other locations across the city, and that, and that is that she brings up the point of exploring how the county can reimburse the city for costs associated with uh, <laughs> abating or providing source sites in, in, in on county property, and so uh, we similarly in, in District 2, we have locations that uh, are home to some of the newly established source sites, which I'm very much supportive of and excited about. And we're going to um, make sure that it's shared far and far and wide with the residents that I represent. Uh, but what I'm curious about is and seeing if staff is open to exploring this similar to what Councilmember Spars is mentioning, but essentially exploring uh, how we can get Caltrans to uh, to reimburse the city for some of the work we're doing on their properties. Uh, is, is that a possibility? Uh, is some of that happening? Can you can can someone from housing touch on that? On your thoughts? Yeah. Hi, Councilmember Reagan Henninger with the Housing Department. I'll um, I'll do my best. Uh, although my colleagues from Beautify San Jose who manage those interagency <clears throat> agreements aren't here this evening, but ah, I good. think that is. Uh, the purpose of having those interagency agreements with um, entities like Caltrans and Valley Water is to work out that um, potential for cost sharing. I will say we have, we do have an agreement with the county for cost sharing for our trash related cleanup services. Um, but oh. I can't, I'm not sure what the agreement is with Caltrans. Okay, and obviously county is the county, Caltrans is the state, right? So Correct. <laughs> pro probably slightly different dynamic there. Uh, I would just say that, um, you know, it, it's something my team and I are going to lean on you, all, well, the Beautify SJ team and, and other folks that are exploring this to, to see if this is possible. And, and I want to make sure that we're leaning on our state representatives <laughs> To, to, to really have those important conversations with Caltrans, because it seems to me that Caltrans has stepped up on occasion, essentially agreeing to let us utilize some of the properties that we've built some of these bridge housing communities on. Uh, it, it seems like a logical extension of that discussion to then broach this idea of how we can get right of access to the properties in addition to trying to figure out how we can, you know, share the cost or have them reimburse us, whatever that may be. So. Just wanted to put that on the radar and make sure the, that my colleagues were aware that, that that's something that concerns me because I imagine it exists in other parts of the city. 
Um, the other, um, the other question I had is, is so I'm very excited, as I mentioned, about the establishment of the source sites, specifically the ones in District 2. Um, it, but I'm curious, and, and again, if this is falls under the Butif ISJ uh, team, we can certainly take it up with them. Them, I think we have a meeting with them tomorrow. But uh, is there is there a strategy for expressing and showing to the residents and the surrounding areas around the source sites that are going up how the the addition of services via the source sites are really going to help solve some of the issues they're seeing daily? Uh, I, and obviously, you know, there's a host of things we provide with the source sites, but I'm curious if you have any thoughts on just how to best express that to some of the folks, neighbors. If you will. Yeah, I, I think um, we're working with Beautify San Jose on a, a little bit broader approach to um, have meetings and information sessions with community members about our encampment management policies in general, right? Like where where do we prioritize encampment abatements? Um, all of that body of work that Beautify San Jose is working on, housing will be a part of those conversations with neighborhoods mm -hmm. and community members because obviously we have the piece about um, services to the people via our street outreach teams and street-based case management um, and some of our kind of basic needs services like support bodies and hand washing stations and mobile showers and laundry. Right. Okay. And, and the reason I ask is that one of the new source sites that's going to be at the Eden Park Place South by Rue Ferrari, essentially down the block from the existing uh, bridge housing community that's going to grow in size. Um, and, uh, you know, I think taking the news of the establishment of the source site is going to be important to the residents and more importantly, the businesses in the area that consistently <laughs> are sending me emails and complaining and being, um, you know, quite mean in some of their comments to my staff. Uh, I, I just, you know, I, I'd like to think that there's going to be some very concrete things we're going to be able to tell them as it relates to, to getting added services there and trying to get some of those folks out of there it, it's next to the to, to the one of the tra park trails um and i we have a very real fear that uh some of the rvs that have a host of items stored on the street uh are using um generators and and have the potential to cause some grass fires and and so um anyway j just thinking through that and, and we'll discuss that with beautify sj as well but i just thought that was important to mention because I, I think if the residents when we tell them that we're establishing store sites i think they it's going to be very helpful to think through exactly what what it is they should expect from that right and i have my ideas as to what that's going to supply and produce for them but uh you know I, I think they need to see some sort of result or change in behavior in order to get in order for us to get a little bit more buy-in from them. Um, the, the other thing I hope is that, you know, as far as District 2's concerns and the establishment of the new source sites, my hope is that some of these source sites, for example, the one I just mentioned where there, in my mind, there's a real fire danger or another source site on the corner of uh, Blossom Hill and Monterey Road across from the A and PM, it's quite literally in the middle of a construction zone where we're getting the new interchange uh, developed on the 101 and Blossom Hill. Um, it's just really an unsafe area. And so uh, to, to the point that uh, Council Member Cohen raised in his memo, my thoughts are that if we bring SOAR services to that side and eventually get them relocated, my hope is that uh, you as housing or Beautify SJ team can, can then figure out how to reallocate some of those resources to other parts of the city that, to then provide those services that other communities uh, desire. Um, and, and let me let me just conclude with just saying that uh, each time we have discussions about homelessness, I'm often reminded. You know, I was thinking about Gail's comments, but I'm often reminded of the of the compassion I think that we all have for those folks that are living on the street. But but the the very real, especially in the roles that we're in as elected officials representing everyone in the community, the the counterweight, the counterbalance, if you will, to that is is representing the interest and in the. And, and, and the desires of many of the people that are housed, right? And that's the inherent challenge that I think we have as elected officials is recognizing the plight of the folks on the street, but knowing that at the, while 
we're trying to solve that and be uh, thoughtful about it uh, and caring about it. We also, you know, struggle with trying to provide a safe, clean community for the folks that are housed, that aren't on the street, obviously. Um, and, and so that's that's a very real challenge. And, and so, um, you know, I think, as I often tell my residents, that if I could push a button and solve solve all this in one fell swoop, I'd do, I would have done that a long time ago. I don't think any of us desire uh, to get yelled at, to have these meetings that become contentious or to say that hear people tell us that we don't care. I think we're all in this business, you know, getting paid the big bucks. And of course, I'm being sarcastic, but doing this work because we care about the community. That's why we're here. Um, and we don't, I don't pretend to have all the solutions, but uh, I think we as a city have continued to strive and moving forward in, in a very um, positive way to, to grasp for solutions. And it's going to take time, but I think we're making some good efforts. So with that, thank you so much for all the uh, effort you and the housing department have done and obviously the Beautify SJ team. And, uh, you know, there's a lot more to do. So onward. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. If I could just have like a brief yeah, please. response. Um, perhaps your office and the Housing Department could work together on some outreach in the Eden Park area. I know you and I have been out there together before with some of those um, neighbors business. and business leaders. I'd be happy to go out again and talk about SOAR and, and what it means. Um, but for us, what it means is that we can spend some time out there in with those households that are living in their vehicles, try and build some trust, um, and then be able to offer them a spot to participate in the safe parking program that will open up in October. Yeah. And, and, I, and yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate it. I just wanted to highlight I think a broader shift in the SOAR program for the council when we implemented SOAR, uh, it was really in, in response to COVID-19 and delivering services to people who were living outside um, who needed access to kind of basic needs services. I think as we have come out of COVID-19 and into recovery and we have now shifted into this encampment management model um we do know there are there are sites that are going to be abated i think soar is an opportunity to focus some resources on encampments if we know there's a safety issue or in the long term it's going to be abated and it's an opportunity to work with individuals intensively before that encampment abatement occurs um, to us, it's a better option to try and bring, bring people inside um, rather than abate. And we're in that game of whack-a-mole where we abate and people move and then they come back and we're continually um, chasing people around the city. I think having SOAR as this dedicated resource with street outreach teams that have clinicians, case managers, um, outreach folks with lived experience of homelessness, I think that's an opportunity um, to provide some meaningful options to folks who are living outside. So I just wanted to highlight for council that that shift. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And, and I, I, I think it's going to be a positive thing for, for, the, for the areas that already have SOAR, that have experienced this, but obviously the areas that are getting the SOAR services. I think it's going to be great. Um, let, let me just, I know I said that was it, but I, I, you reminded me of something that I, I thought about saying because this has brought, been brought up consistently for me, uh, both among some of the residents that I currently represent, in addition to some of the residents I used to represent that are now, uh, you know, Councilmember Mahan has inherited some, some of my residents. And so they've often asked me about the, the, the VTA parking lot. And so I just wanted to express in case any of them are listening is that my intention when my team and I came up with the idea of working with VTA to establish that location off Santa Teresa light rail station as an RV safe parking was with the sole purpose of, of having the RVs within then District 2, right, in South San Jose, having a place for them to go because we consistently still, and even in the past, have received many, many calls, as I'm sure many of my other colleagues do, 
about RVs in the street near schools, dumping waste, whatever it may be, right? And so that was that that idea came from trying to find a solution to some of the issues that we were grappling with. And so I wanted to just express that because it's been brought to me many, many times. And I think there was even a recall petition circulating <laughs> around my my candidacy here or, or my, me, me as a council member uh, around the idea that the reason I, I wanted to establish that was to bring all the RVs from Columbus Park. And I just want to plainly very say that that was not the intention. Um, I, I don't think we can accommodate all them. Uh, but um, and I think the council member in District 4, District 3, I'm sure will desire to have their own RV safe parking. But I just wanted to express very clearly to any resident that's listening, that, that was never the intention. And that I don't hope, I hope that doesn't happen because that wasn't the intention. Uh, and so uh, just wanted to share that. that. It was very important to say. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Mahan. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, staff, for the uh, the report and all the work you've done with our service providers to bring these contracts forward. I want to uh, say a couple of quick thank yous and then ask a question. So, so thank you to Councilmember Jimenez for his comments, particularly that last one. And um, I, I think that point about, to the extent possible, having a local preference or a focus on local impact that makes neighborhoods better, better not worse off when they take on sites is really important. So I just appreciate his uh, his intention and vision there, and and uh, it's certainly something I'm I'm trying to communicate now in the the, the part of the district that that I've uh, inherited. So thank you for that. I also appreciate the memos from uh, my colleagues, Councilmembers uh, Cohen, and as far as uh, you know, I think safe parking, which we are continuing to move forward in District 10, is an important solution. And I I also really appreciate the uh, focus in Councilmember Sparza's memo on cost sharing with the county around service delivery. I think we know we, we can't do everything at the city and we certainly can't do it alone and having uh, the county in their area of expertise help with um, funding services feels very promising to me in a way to scale our efforts. So I appreciate that. Uh, since it came up in uh, public comment, I see we do have a lot of folks here in public comment. I, I appreciated that a few people mentioned outcomes and performance measurement, which is near and dear to my heart. And Reagan, I noticed in the staff memo, I think it was the first of two staff memos, I appreciated that where possible staff included the number of participants who exited into permanent housing, which I, I think is, is certainly one important measure of success. I, I do think I'll, I'll make one more statement here and then kind of pivot to the question. I do think for members of the community, uh, they could be forgiven for feeling like we were much more focused on the dollars we're dispersing, the partners, the source of funding, all the process pieces that are obviously critical and, and you know, very important for us to have oversight of and, and manage carefully. And, and to think when they see our slide deck, our presentation in the meeting here, or read the memo that we're, we're less interested or less focused on those really critical outcomes of how many people not only graduate into permanent housing, but maybe complete a treatment regimen or achieve employment or uh, achieve other really important measures of, of um, bettering their lives or self-sufficiency, right? I think those are the kinds of outcomes our community could get excited about and actually wanna see us put more resources into. And, and so I think we're not necessarily for lack of a better term, marketing our success well enough. I think Councilmember Cohen sort of alluded to that earlier. Um, and, and frankly, I also just think it's important from a public trust perspective that we are front loading and emphasizing in our presentation decks, the impact and the, the measurement and the analysis that we're doing to understand which service providers are delivering the best outcomes. I think that's really important. So uh, here's the question I, I noticed on page five of the initial staff memo, there's a sentence there that seems pretty important to me that says negotiation with partners on the number of participants who will be served as well as performance outcomes are in the beginning stages and are not included in the summaries of the agreements described in this memorandum, which we're presumably approving here. So I guess the question is, you know, is, is that avoidable in the future? Can we identify, that? personally, I think it would be important for us to identify success measures and any commitments that are being made up front prior to council approving um, 
are moving forward with contracts. So to, to what extent is that possible? Can you maybe help just for the public's understanding, help us understand why we're not there right now with these contracts? Sure, thanks for the question. I'll start and then um, Kelly can fill in whatever I've omitted. Um, so what council is approving right now is authority um, for the director of housing to negotiate contracts with um, all of the entities. The, we had a, we do address some um, highlights or past performance on many of these contracts, which are renewals. Um, in other words, contracts or programs we funded in the past. We come to council um, typically in the winter with an annual report on our homeless programs that says how we did, how we did in all of our metrics and outcomes and basically how many people did we house. Um, we did have a slide tonight about our metrics and our outcomes. We are part of a broader continuum of care with the county and other cities um, in Santa Clara County. We have agreed upon metrics and outcomes for our homeless and housing programs. Um, for example, 30% um, of people who exit a, an emergency shelter will exit to a permanent housing destination. That's the minimum standard for all of our emergency shelter programs. And keep in mind, emergency shelters are basically uh, a program designed to meet someone's basic needs. Um, oftentimes, it's less focused on housing outcomes. So um, I think what I am trying to articulate to you, council member, is we have standard um, outcomes that we are striving for as an entire system. And the city of San Jose is um, one piece of that system, and I'll turn it over to Kelly in case I've omitted anything. There's a lot to say about that question. Um, I think I would just add, as far as why we're not there yet, so we don't have our projected numbers for you today, I th over the past few years, we have taken contracts to you all for approval one by one, and this is the second time that we've come forward with a what we call a mega memo coming with um, multiple contracts um, because we really want to expedite those contracts and get the services started at the beginning of the fiscal year. We have um, had a history of getting started pretty late um, based on a lot of reasons. One being coming coming to council for approval and, and going through it's a long process to get a, a contract executed. So I so. Kelly, if I could just interject, I, I, yeah, and I, I just want to say, I mean, I, I appreciate, the, actually, I think the fact that they're all together is a strength because, it, as you're pointing out, it, it, it's a more efficient, but I also think it could give us the opportunity for a comparative analysis of who's delivering the most impact, the most cost effectively in different categories of service. I, I, I think. And I would say, Council Member, we deliver that comparative analysis in our annual homeless report, which we do. Um, yeah, let me let me just two in this staff report. Yeah. No, I understand, but let me just finish. I I, I I I appreciate that. I I think that when we are reviewing contracts, so we just had a conversation earlier today about a technology service provider whose contract was not renewed. I don't think any contracts with the city should be in any way assumed that they're going to be automatically renewed. And I'm I'm not saying that you're saying that, but I, I do think that they should be based on rigorous analysis of performance. And while it's great to have a minimum bar of 30% of people will, will exit uh, to permanent housing, I actually think what we want to be doing with these service providers is identifying objective measures of success, multiple measures, and then actually showing whenever we bring forward a new contract renewal, how they did against those measures in the past. And so the the goal would not be to simply clear the bar of minimum. It would actually be to say, who is most cost effectively helping the most people in the ways that we are trying to measure that help as being successful. So I just I think there's a more 
rigorous way of evaluating performance and then being able to measure across per service providers and, and show who's having the greatest impact I, I, and which sites are having the greatest impact. And that's a place to generate insights and learnings. And so I just, my observation, I, I think you heard it in the public comment and I, I still see it in the presentation tonight is that we're very focused on the process side of this, which is no doubt the lion's share of the work. But I just think from our perspective, seeing the, um, the analytics around performance and what our success measures are and having that, I don't want to see that separated out in an annual summary. I'd like to see that be integrated into the conversation we're having around which contracts we're renewing and, and how, they, how they're scoring basically, sort of as we did earlier with the software contract. So I'll leave it at that, but I just, I, I think there's room for improvement. I wanted to express that. Um, but please feel free to, if you want to, you know, chime in again, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off there, but I just, I wanted to complete that thought. And Cher, that's, um, that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, Captain Paulus. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I want to share a couple of thoughts on um, the work, but, but first just um, responding to Councilman Mahan's thoughts there. I think there's one um, flawed assumption in the argument um, for the request that Councilman Mahan's making, and that, that somehow there's like a plethora of organizations out there knocking at our door ready to, to come and compete for this work. Um, looking at the contracts that we are uh, looking to renew or, or setting up new here, I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time trying to figure out which companies or organizations, nonprofits in the city, we are not contracted with for some work that, um, that would somehow come and, you know, compete rigorously to do what happens to be, right, the, the absolute hardest work in the city. Um, and, and this is just a, this is a real quick, you know, glance over and, considering the last eight years, all the different organizations that I've worked with in the city and trying to see who, am I, am I right in that assumption, Reagan, that it looks like, I mean, almost everybody that's doing something in the city here, we've got a contract with to do something, correct? Yeah, I'd say that's a, a fair statement. And I'll, I'll just give an example of safe parking. Um, we, the housing department, the way our government processes as we put out a competitive bid for proposals for when we want to contract out for a service. Um, and those proposals are rated and um, rated and evaluated and um, and chosen based on what they can produce or what they said they could produce. Um, when we put out a request for proposals for safe parking, we had one organization respond. Um, so you are correct. There's not, oftentimes uh, nonprofits may have a particular specialty. So for example, there's probably um, one or two agencies that specialize in the safe parking program, just for example. But And the nonprofits have wisely done this over the years, rather than compete with one another, find their individual strengths, right? Where they may be able to, to, to support each other because we know uh, it really takes this mosaic of support and, and you, there's not necessarily organizations that are, oh, I'm, I'm going to do it all. Um, there's some that really specialize in particular areas and then they focus on that and they'll compete, as you point out, uh, for safe parking. And, and I know in the past, we've almost had to encourage organizations, right, to go sort of out of their wheelhouse and say, hey, can you help us? Can you apply for this, right? Could you could you create this uh, opportunity within your organization to stretch and do like the source sites? That was a brand new operation that we, you know, engaged in. It's not like going to the store and picking out a printer and you know you got all these different companies that are doing that. They're already out there on the table. It's very very complicated. And when we initiated on the source sites, nobody was doing that work in the city here because that wasn't even in existence. And so um, I just I, I recognize. Um, the interest to, to be successful here. I share that with Councilman Mahan, um, but I also recognize the realities of the challenges uh, in that who's doing this work. And there's not a, a laundry list of people out there competing to do this work. We honestly have to work hand in hand with these organizations and, and, and simply just hope 
that we actually do get somebody to apply, as you pointed out, for an RFP in that, in that case, right, that we didn't get zero, because we've had that before, where we've had nobody apply. Um, and so those are just realities uh, of what we're dealing with here. And, um, you know, I think to, to, to simply look at, hey, success as a, um, as a measure, as if there is an alternative solution out there to go to, is not reality. We need to help create success, not simply just demand it. We need to help create it with these organizations and recognize that, that the burden falls on, on us as, as equally as it does as them. Um, and, and I know I've had some you know, challenges with certain nonprofits here in the city. I know we've heard some of that right here. And I know clearly you're not in your head right there. That's the case, right? They're not all perfect. And there's times where they're, you know, we, we need to get them to do better. But uh, it's not as easy as, hey, uh, you know, sorry, we're going to move on from you because there's not necessarily somebody sitting there in line waiting to do the work. Um, so we, we have to work with them. And, um, and I've seen a lot of great success when we do that. And I've seen some improvement and I've seen, um, right, these, these organizations and individuals do that work. Um, and then to go down even one level, because I know we're talking about them as if they're just a broad organization, um, it's, it's individuals doing this work, right, at the end of the day. And for the most part, they're paid um, right, pretty poorly. Uh, the ones that are doing the, the hardest work, the outreach workers, um, on-site, site workers. And, uh, and during the last couple of years, they faced, you know, harder times than we did here at the city with transition and, you know, uh, lack of, 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 of applications themselves. And, um, you know, and, and they still face some of those challenges. And so it's, it's you know, um, if, if it was as simple as, hey, there is a tremendous solution or program out there and and they know how to solve this problem uh god forbid i know we would be hiring those organizations and so it's it's not that simple and and i think that um right we we can monitor and and record data and and, and try to achieve you know better success but i think we need to look at it from a standpoint of how do we do that together how do we help encourage success from these organizations um and not simply just um measure and then respond um, and then I, I wanted to add that I am, um, if, if you know, I, I have accepted the fact in the faith that we're not going to go to sanctioned encampments. So if source sites are the closest that we are going to get, I am ex excited and happy, um, right? The district three has the most of them and we've had that, um, right? Again, I, what I didn't like about the source sites was that we didn't get to choose the location, but I've accepted that fate and right. And we are, we are providing a service, which in my mind is way better than just going and continually whack-a-mole displacing people. That is something ultimately that I wanted to avoid, and I think the source sites have allowed us to do that. Um, and then I'm, I'm excited to see that we have a, a, an RV uh, spot in the expanded source sites coming to District 3. This is half a mile from my house. Um, and and you know I know we get the concerns from community members, hey, this is right here in, in, in my community, and, and you guys wouldn't do that. Too. Yes, yes, we do uh, regularly, and, and this is uh, you know half a mile from my house, which means it's about a mile or less from the mayor's house. Um, and in fact, I, I'm, I'm wondering if you looked at commercial between 10th and 7th as another opportunity. We have RVs parked there right now, all the time. And so, you know, um, is there an opportunity? Did you already look at that for one? And if not, is there an opportunity to potentially expand in the future? Um, I will look to Vanessa to say yes, I think we did look at commercial, but. I might have you come down and say why we didn't exactly go with that site. And then I will say, council member, that we're open to um, working with you in the future on a potential expansion. I think the idea here is as more store resources, i.e. our store staff, our street-based clinicians and case managers, as their time frees up, for example, when we close the heading and spring encampment at the end of September, that's sort of the all hands on deck situation right now, um, where multiple teams are working there. But I think as we close that encampment, we'll have a little bit of freed up resources and we might be able to expand. Great. Vanessa. Hello, Vanessa Beretta with the housing department. Uh, we, yes, we did explore uh, commercial. We did this. Uh, uh, site selection in partnership with our uh, partners at Beautify SJ and so we had determined this list based on uh, the criteria set and the needs um, when we were meeting with them so as Reagan uh, mentioned we were trying to just target some of those areas specifically that have had habitual uh, problems in the past and really significant issues such as the fires 
and uh, the the blocking of the right of ways and such. And so, um, on the, we chose the the two sites to pilot. The city loves to pilot, so we're going to pilot these two sites, see what we can make work, and hopefully we can expand this service. Okay. Well, then great. So then there's still an opportunity there for that commercial, and and, and I think it's very similar to the. 15th Street between Charles and commercial it's it's commercial between 10th and 7th and I think it's you know again similar and I think it, it would be a great opportunity and, I, and quite frankly I'd rather see that than simply at some point disperse you know the the couple dozen RVs that are there today <laughs> and just have them land somewhere else in the community so um, with that though thank you for uh, the, the work here and um, I think we already have a motion so thank you I'd like to make the, the case that I think uh, two things can be true. Um, one, as Councilmember Perales said, that um, it's really hard to persuade uh, a lot of folks to get into this line of work. And uh, there are a limited number of organizations that are also strapped for staff that are doing really hard work. And um, uh, the notion that we're gonna have a lot of competitors uh, quite often is is not likely. We know there've been RFPs where we're not getting um, we're not getting multiple bidders or any at all. On the other hand, I think the strong case for accountability can still be made because we are making trade-offs between how we're investing dollars, and we know some things that we're doing definitely work. Rapid rehousing works. Prevention works. We're seeing outcomes that I think we want to see. I think you saw, I think what you reported was 80% of rapid rehousing clients are getting onto permanent housing. That's tremendous. On the other hand, there are things we're doing, we're probably, you know, we're going to follow it and may not be that successful. And that may tell us we should divest and focus our scarce dollars on those things we know work. And so I think both things can be true here. We, we do need to continue to hold the organizations accountable for reporting results, for high standards of of outcomes because this is obviously public money and we all care about the outcomes because this is critically important work and people's lives depend on it. So um, I, I, I really think that, you know, the discussion here between Council Member Mahan and, and Paralysis is an important one, but I, I do think the situation where two things can be true. Um, I, I had, you know, on that general topic of sort of outcomes, I know Gail was, was very critical, one of the members of the public um, who we all know uh, it's been very active in in homelessness advocacy. Um, she was critical, particularly I think of Home First in some of the source sites. I took a look at the the data we have from the 2022 annual report for SOAR. We had Home First and PATH, I think it's partners uh, organizations in that. And they served 417 people under those contracts. And I'm wondering, did how did that compare with our expectations, our, our our thresholds for what we expected them to do with the dollars we were allocating. For SOAR, yes. Yes, yeah. that was for SOAR, yeah. Is, is, was 417 something that we believe was? Well, it was unduplicated. Good performance? Yeah, it was unduplicated. Yeah. Um, I think that's pretty good, okay. um, especially with the goal being to work with people in order to come up with this with the housing plan and a long-term plan for their leaving the encampment into something more stable um it takes a long time sometimes to engage people and really um it could take a couple weeks it could take six months just to learn their name um outreach is hard and so you know while it's very proactive and that's something really great about SOAR, you're going back to the same people um, week over week. And so you're seeing the same people and you're building those relationships. So I think over 400 people is actually um, a pretty good mark. We're going to continue to um, create more teams so we can reach more people and more encampments and maybe follow people who leave encampments and and go to bigger encampments. I think you know we just want to keep those relationships. And right. Okay. Well, thank you. I because I don't really I don't feel like I have a frame of reference to understand. Is four hundred seventeen good? <laughs> Is it not good? And 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 maybe it's 
as you're reporting these results, and I know we do have an end of the year report, and so you guys do do the report metrics and outcomes, and that's important. Um, it would be occasionally helpful just to kind of insert those, hey, here's what our goal was, you know, and we hit it, or, or whatever it might be. So we have a, a frame of reference, I think it's helpful. Um, again, this isn't about sort of punishing nonprofits or making them look bad or anything like that. I think it's about understanding how we're making our best investment possible. Maybe nobody's fault that a particular approach or modality is not going to work. It just, the reality is we're all trying a lot of different things. And what the housing department has done over the last several years with innovation, it's been really tremendous. It's probably unlike just about any other city in the country. And just the breadth of things that we've tried and what we've learned and what we've been able to apply. And um, it's important for us to, as a council to be able to, and, and the public to be able to learn what's working, what's not, and where we need to refocus. Um, the, there was a contract from last year that came up with, that we authorized from the budget message a year ago. Um, and I think it was, we hope was one of the bidders, but I'm not sure if they're the ones that did it. And it had to do with bathrooms, uh, trying to make public bathrooms accessible um, in parks and so forth. And I'm just wondering what happened. Did we actually implement that contract? And it doesn't appear to be re-upped here. And I'm just trying to understand sort of what was the outcome. Yeah, it's happening. I'll um, turn it over to Kelly, but we did launch it. Okay. You coined this. It's the Bathroom Attendant Pilot Program. Oh, how about that? <laughs> I couldn't come up with a better name than that. <laughs> uh, through the SJ Bridge Program. And, um, and it is up and running. Um, let me see. Let me give you. It's been... It's I'm going to ask if everyone could please be quiet uh, so we can hear Kelly. Thank you. Yes, open forum always happens at the conclusion. Ma'am, open forum always happens at the conclusion of the meeting. That's the way we've always done it every Tuesday. We can't tell you that. It's when we resolve. Our, we only have one more matter after this, and then we resolve it. But I'm not going to respond again. The next person, the next person who speaks out, I'm going to ask to be removed. We will have public forum at the conclusion of this meeting. Thank you. Kelly? The program, the pilot program, has been operating for six weeks thus far. It is operating at four sites. Um, the work crews are servicing the units, replenishing the, the, the toilet paper and just monitoring the bathrooms. The four parks are Bernal Park, Bacesto Park, Watson Park, and McHenry Park. And we are um, piloting those four parks, and then we hope to make it to Columbus Park, for instance. I know that was a target area, and we're assessing other parks, but it, so far it's going pretty well. Okay, I appreciate that. I know that's um, critical service for those in need. Um, I think your, your staff mayor brought up uh, Tully Park to us yeah, uh, we did. earlier this week. We're happy to um, explore that. I appreciate that. I know there were some youth programs where the bathrooms were shut down and it'd be wonderful to keep those open for the public. Um, I, I appreciate all the, the answers you've, you've given to the many questions we've all posed. I just offer in closing, you know, there's no award for it could have been worse. Uh, nobody gets that award. Nobody gives it. Um, but I was just sent a text from, it was actually a tweet that Jennifer Loving sent me about Sacramento County, and I guess that their homeless count, their pit count just came in, and they doubled their homeless count in about three years. Uh, now, ours is countywide is about where it was three years ago. We actually had a slight decline in the city on, on unsheltered homeless. Obviously, we all would like to see that number drop sharply, and we're all doing everything we can to do that. But uh, we're in an environment, obviously, this pandemic with much larger forces at work. And I think it is important to recognize um, that if we're able to at least reduce the number of unsheltered homeless, uh, even by a small amount, uh, that may be something of a success compared to what we're seeing all around us. So we'll continue to, to push ahead, and I appreciate all the hard work. All right, uh, let's vote on the motion. Oh, could I uh, request one thing yes. on the motion? It was with Esparza's memo on number one. Uh, she did request a return to council with that safety assessment for the store program. I would just request that that um, information be provided to council in the form of an information memo. Okay, that's all right with the make of the motion. 
Yes. Okay. All right, let's vote then on the motion. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Rahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay, we have one more item on the agenda, but we have to revote. I'm told on one other item. That's 2.12. That's terms of a side letter agreement between the city and uh, the International Union of Operating Engineers, local number three, and the Association of Maintenance Supervisory Personnel, local 21, amending the pay plan. Uh, this was a consent agenda item. Um, we have one member of the council who uh, would like to recuse herself. So, uh, do we need a motion to reconsider, Nora? Yes. All right. Is there a motion? Move to reconsider. Second. Okay. okay. And just a, a clarification, Mayor. Do we have to recall the entire consent since that was the motion, and then maybe make two motions? Oh boy. No. <laughs> Nora, no. can we just reconsider the vote on two point twelve? I think you can just reconsider the vote on uh, two twelve and make that motion to reconsider two twelve only. Okay. Pull that out. We will do that. That is a motion reconsider on just on two twelve. Let's vote. Jimenez. Yes. Morales? Uh, yes, and I'll stay in my lane next time. Sorry, Nora. Owen? <laughs> Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. I move approval of 2.12. Second. All right. Uh, there's a motion from Councilmember Cohen, second Councilmember Foley. Is there a recusal? She may not be present. Um, she just voted. She's there. Uh, Councilmember Davis. Reynas, would you like to announce a recusal? Uh, sure. I'm recusing myself from this vote. Thank you. All right. Let's vote on this item 2.12. Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay, we're going to call the order a special meeting now as a public hearing on the no. local homelessness action plan. No. Um, that's a completely separate meeting, so we need to do open forum. Okay. And then we need to adjourn this meeting, and okay. then we need to take like a five minute break and then start the next meeting. Because okay. It's too so system. let's take open forum now? Yes. All right, let's go to open forum now. Okay, so those people whose hands I kept putting down um, on Zoom, go ahead and raise your hand if and you want to speak Tony, on open forum. If I, if I could just offer a couple sentences uh, as prefatory remarks. I, okay. We know that there are many members of the community who are very concerned about the location of uh, interim emergency housing uh, or quick build apartment communities, as I call them. Uh, we have, um, there are several of us who have submitted a memorandum that will be considered by the Rules Committee in August that will set, uh, if approved, set a public hearing in November. Uh, at that time, we'll have much more information about various sites, including the ones that are identified after, obviously, public outreach. Uh, and at that time, the council will be in a position to fully hear the concerns of the community and actually make decisions uh, based on all of that information. So I want folks to know that there is a going to be a public forum when we'll actually be making decisions as opposed to simply having a public forum where you speak your mind and then nothing happens. So, all right, Tony. Okay, and did you want to do one minute since we have another meeting after this one? Um, we are, uh, how many? I have 148 people online. Yeah, okay. We're going to need to do that because we need to get our work done tonight. So yeah. uh, we're going to limit public comment to one minute so we can get uh, onto okay. our rest of our business. And I will start with the people um, in person and these are in the order they were received. I'm going to call names, come to the microphone. The first person who gets to the microphone just start speaking. Everybody else will line up on the stairs. I'm gonna do four to five names at a time. As soon as you hear names, go ahead and make your way forward. Don't wait for that person to stop speaking. I have Ray or Roy, Lyra, Julian Pe Peng, P-E-N-G, um, Keith Ta, Robert M and Mar go ahead and Margaret Wheeler. That's the first set. And if you st say your name before you start speaking, that would be great because then I'll know that you actually spoke. 
Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Zuling Pan. I'm a resident on Piedmont Road, a father to two little boys whose home school is Novo Elementary School. Obviously, I'm one of the many who are against the idea to put 100 tiny little homes right next to Novo Elementary. And firstly, I have to say I like this idea of tiny home. I think this is a great idea that can help people to bring up their life from the rock bottom to a better life. I used to be a broke up college kid who had only $27 for a week to spend on everything, the food, the laundry, everything, $27. Even at that time, there was once I had only 10 bucks in my pocket. I still gave it to someone in the street because he needed more than I did. My mom has been teaching me to help people ever since I was a kid. I believe her. So I like this idea of tiny home. The only thing I'm uh, against is this specific location. It's right next to an uh, elementary school. And I just don't get what could be a good reason this location can be ranked top six out of, a lo out of 100 other locations. And Thank you. Oh, that's it? That's it. One minute. Next speaker, also Lee Wheeler, come, um, come down. Go ahead. First thing's fine. All right, everybody. So we are not opposed to providing homes for the homeless. We understand that it's just a spot that was chosen on Noble Avenue. We've even gone around and checked spots out. And right now, what we've seen, we're the only ones in the neighborhood. The site on Noble is a, it's an actual neighborhood park, which supports indigenous and migratory wildlife. The site is across the street from an elementary school, a library, and a daycare center. Another elementary school is right behind it. The middle school is right down the street. This, the, this was a very poor decision by the city council in many of our opinions. Also, if the tiny home site is built there, it will be set the precedence for all neighborhoods. All other districts need to know how you all voted that this can happen anywhere. This is setting the tone for everywhere. No one, no schools except the city council that wants to do this decision. The city, the city council voted on this issue without notifying our neighborhood. The, this vote was made after the primaries. It was made after the schools were closed. Families were on vacation. That's very interesting. Thank you. Next speaker, I'm Lee Wheeler. I don't know if you heard me call your name. Um, Frank Wu. Hey, I, I'm gonna don't don't start yet. I'm gonna ask people to not applaud because they won't be able to hear me call their name. And we want to get through all of the speakers. We don't want to have to cut people down to 30 seconds to get everybody heard. So please refrain from clapping. If you want to show your support, you can do jazz hands. The council will see that. But we want I want to make sure everybody gets their turn. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Judy. Thank you for your time being with us. And uh, I represent the uh, size of 85 and uh, Prospect. Uh, it's a residential area and there are many young kids. I bring my two sons with me today. We, uh, we purchased the house and we want uh, our kids in a safe area. I know we want to help the homeless people, but I, I think uh, not just put them in, find a spot and let them live there. We need to find a better way, like a transportation voucher or something else, a, 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 better, uh, a better policy to solve this issue. Um, because uh, we don't, we, we are in a uh, residential area and there are library, schools and parks nearby. We want our kids to, to work in the neighborhood safely. Uh, so you, Thank I feel you. you need to put yourself. Next speaker, also Chris, Chris and Duke. And okay, if people don't hear their names, they can't come speak. Chris and Duke, go ahead and make your way over. Go ahead, speaker. Hi, um, my name is Keith Ta, and uh, I just moved in the neighborhood uh, uh, last year. And um, about 40 years ago, 40 some years ago, I was a homeless kid living on a street. And uh, I could see see the sound, the smell, and the environment that I lived in. Um, I know that we, we need to help uh, the homeless uh, people. 
However, the 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 main concern that I I have for that site is is right across from the uh, elementary. Uh, last I checked, uh, there will be 400 plus children that uh, will attend the school when this site is built on, uh, on top of it. Um, and I assume all these individuals are gonna be not not gonna have any um, obligation, not no have any family. How would you, um, how would you like <clears throat> make okay. sure that they don't prey on our kids? Thank you. Next when speaker. they move in. Yeah. Thank you. I prepared um, two minutes. Because we you were have one two minutes. We Why are we one. cut down to one? Because there's a lot of speakers. We're trying to get through all of them. I don't. My name is Margaret Wheeler. I've lived at 3388 Suncrest Avenue for 35 years. Cars speeding through the intersection of Suncrest and Burgundy, running the stop sign. Done it squealing day and night, the smell of burning rubber invading the house. I take my dog Joey on a walk past Noble School and the aftercare, after school care program. The perk cons are ahead. I know I will shed my stress. I'm greeted by bluebirds tweeting, swallows swooping through the air, ducks quacking, frogs croaking, black crowned night herons hunting, turkey vultures looming, fish and turtles languid in the water. What will happen to the wildlife if 400 plus human beings invade their home? We're losing green space everywhere in San Jose. We need to protect our watershed and percolation ponds. Mayor Licardo, how many small homes are by your house? Oh, thank are you. there one? Thank you, next speaker. I can't quite read the handwriting on the next one. It looks like Linen Pinzer, but I'm not positive. Hold on, I'm gonna call one more name. Um, Sandra, go ahead and make your way over. Um, go ahead. Thank Good you. evening, my name's Lee Wheeler. Um, I lived in San Jose my whole life, worked for the city for 30 years. Um, I witnessed this evening what I know to be true is that you guys take your job very seriously. It's a lot of money that you're spending on a, a very complex problem. We are concerned about the location of tiny homes in our community. We think the location is inappropriate. Um, it has already been turned down once when this was uh, proposed about five years ago. Not sure what has changed other than the fact that it's an ideal location because the city owns the property. Uh, we believe that there's other uh, locations that are better suited um, and we'd like the consideration of the council and the uh, housing department to uh, look at those other things with uh, clear eyes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next speaker, also Rodolfo Estrada and James Uzar, come forward. Thank you. My name is my name is Chris. The I'm I sorry. See. Just just one moment, ma'am. Um, uh, Councilmember Crosco, if you could please mute. Never could please mute online. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. You could That's fine. if you could please start over again. Thank my, you. My name is Chris. I'm not going to let the other other uh, previous speaker has made very uh, valid points close to schools and all that. The only thing I I will add is that. I've been living there for over 20 years and the past, um, I, the first day in the morning, I, I walk in a pop pond with my dogs for the past 14, 18 years and decompress and get ready for my, my day to start and face the world. And this, the last, the last thing I do in the evening, walk there, there, and I see wildlife and over the uh, wildlife and decompress myself to, to, you know, end the day. And over the over the years, I have seen some homeless people hanging around there with, and and I think most of them was probably in the drugs and um, relief relieving themselves in the waters. Um, you know, number one and number two, I seen it half naked, all naked, in the water as well. So those are the more of the um, really hazardous. Thank you, Margie Matthews. Make your way over. Next speaker, come to the mic. Seven strikes against the location, not the idea. One, it was already successfully vetoed and found not viable and should have never been put back on the table. Two, it is directly across the street from Noble Elementary School. 
Three, it's across the street from Noble Library. Four, it's across the street from a daycare center. Five, it is very near Toyon Elementary. Six, it is down the street from Pleasanton Middle School. Seven, it is land that has been and is a popular park, a walking trail for countless neighbors, families, a sanctuary for a wide variety of wildlife, indigenous and migratory. We cannot believe that the seven very valid seri serious strikes against it. Thank you. Th um, Sheikh Hua Tang. Sheikh Hua, hold on. Sheikh Hua Tang. Go ahead. Well, member, Council, Mayor Licardo, my name is Rodolfo. I come before you guys today with great sadness to see how poorly this was strategized you guys claim that you guys care and you do this out of passion yet when we're looking at the agenda you guys talk about the budget you guys talk about the contracts set in place about the projects that we have and there's very very poor planning and if this was a council that actually cared about the community and at the development that we are looking for you would have actually done a little bit more research not just on the location the financials what would be the best development it sounds very misleading on how you guys are portraying information today. And I would request for you guys to reconsider, put a little bit more empathy into this and consider the community. At the end of the day, we all want to help the homeless. We all want to find the solution. Yet all it seems that you guys are trying to do is put a patch that's going to solve nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Oscar Herrera. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Jim Puzar. Uh, so, I, Mr. Mayor, City Council members, uh, so, so I've lived in the neighborhood for over 30 years now, and it's always been an open space area where you could walk your dogs and everything like that. And while I respect that uh, the need for dealing with the homeless problem is a big problem, this is probably not the right place to put it. And, uh, you know, it's across, as other people have mentioned, it's across from the elementary school, things like that. But I think it's just a a bad idea all right and uh, appreciate you if you could rethink the idea and come back with some other solutions thank you thank you next speaker Hello, I'm represent uh, West San Jose. Com I mean West San Jose community. I come here is really serious about the uh, put a tiny house uh, in the West San Jose, especially in uh, in our uh, location. Yes, I support the homeless. Doing my I mean uh, lifelong, I already served the homeless project and uh, also served the community for years. But this time, it's really wrong location because around our uh, you know the number six location. We have 44 schools around the location, 44 schools. And we have 29 schools, is, I mean, within the one miles. And the, four, I mean, the, the other 44 is in two miles, choppies. We really don't want this to happen. We are concerned about our, our children's safety because a lot of that is elementary student, I mean, schools and also learning center is really, uh, is not good for the homeless too. Thank you. Next speaker. Mayor, council member, council member Cohen, I'm happy to be here. This is my first time back here since I've retired. Um, and it's only this that would get me out of my house and get my mask off. Um, I know how dire the homeless situation is. I was a director of affordable housing for the county for seven years. We worked day after day to find suitable locations. Uh, which were on major thoroughfares, near services, near transit, near grocery stores. This site is just the wrong site. And I'll focus on two things, the parks. The parks, this park, like every other park in our city, are sacred ground. And this park, the community's been working on it for decades, back to 1985. I wish it weren't, I mean, I wish I weren't, it, this were not so, so, but all the many people that enjoy this park for, for quiet relaxation, nature, running, walking. These people will not feel comfortable in this park anymore. I'm uh, pretty fearless, but I doubt that uh, I would feel comfortable walking on this trail, and I walk almost every week. 
Thank you. Uh, the other point is the schools. Schools are already living through radical changes of COVID. Yi Liao, Ajian. So that's Lee. Go ahead. Go to the um, the next uh, to for people to come over and wait. I have Yi Liao and Ajian. Go ahead, sir. Uh, good evening, City Council. Uh, it's an honor to um, be here. So um, I am from West San Jose, and uh, um, if you see the list there, um, the new proposed uh, homeless center site is surrounded by. Um, Within 0.5 miles, we have 12 daycares, preschools, and elementary schools. And within one mile, we have 24 of 25 of them. And within two miles, we have 44 of them. So this is a really a, a, a area of schools and kids. So, um, and the transportation is not so good either. So that, that's, is this really a good spot to put people who need help there? Um, no transportation not real jobs for them, but then potential risk and for the kids and the neighborhood. So um, I, I would really encourage the, um, the, the, the council to consider maybe privatize or use other means, uh, probably build a new tiny homes where the homeless people uh, are currently um, uh, living uh, nearby. So then we can on one hand improve the environment in the current entrapment but the, without really causing um, uh, concerns from the new, another neighborhood. So uh, my suggestion is, can we find places where they can really blend in and get community support and be coherent? And we can have a real uh, solution. And also I noticed that we have a lot of um, homeless population, but adults to enjoy walking, hiking, run, uh, walking dogs, fishing, and bird watching. It is a nice feature on the Penitentia Creek Trail. It connects Penitentia Park and Alum Rock Park. Uh, back in June 4th, 2002, it was, there was an approved plan to improve this site for, with informal play area and family picnic area. What, you know what, I don't see those things at this park. What happened? Uh, did the funds run out? But I think our community got shortchanged. The city didn't invest in the asset in Noble Community. That's a big failure already. And now you want to big, uh, build a big facility on it, uh, a, a facility that doesn't belong in a residential area. I visited Rue Ferrari. I saw four RVs parked on the street, and it was full of trash. And it's something that resembles a correctional facility. This is something that doesn't belong in a community. I, I'm not saying don't build them. Don't build them near in residential areas, near school. Thank you. Next speaker, um, Ping Chu, and Jasmine. Thank you for your time today. I come here just want to say, uh, build a home shelter near school, near the ponds, and near the library is not a really ideal because it impact the children's safety issue. The second, I want to point out. Out, uh, Mayor, can you consider your budget fifty million dollars for building the construction and the three million dollars for the maintenance each year? This is only for temporary. Can you buy? Uh, can you discuss with some of the commercial land to buy land, build affordable apartments or the house? They will resolve the problem for for forever, not just for temporarily. Fifty million dollars plus thirty uh, three million dollars just with taxpayer money. Don't shake your hand. I study economics, much probably better than you. June. I'm, I'm, wait, before you speak, hold on, I want to call another couple names. It's some of the handwriting's hard to read, so I'm, I'm guessing. Ma'am, if, if you've spoken already. Um, uh, I'm, this time I'm talking about no, no, no. homeless no, issue. No, 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 Everyone can speak spoken. once. We've got 100 people waiting yeah. online, so we got to keep it moving. Yeah. Jubo, I think it's Wu. It looks like a W. Um, and Mark Comfort. And I have now called everybody's name. Um, so if you did not hear me call your name because people were applauding, go ahead and um, move over. Um, go ahead. OK. Uh, five years ago, uh, Mayor Lee Colorado, right? You already agreed. No tiny home close to school and park. This is your five years ago. You promised her. 
Good evening. The actual site where these proposed tiny homes are, are meant to go is the Dr. Robert Gross Pond. If you Google the pond, Google calls it a park in San Jose with a 4.1 rating and 51, 53 reviews. And if you go to the, the perk ponds, there's a sign that says, welcome to your neighborhood park. So it's not, a, it's not a, an, an empty lot. It's not unused land. It is welcome to your neighborhood park. This park is shared public space provided for your enjoyment and recreation. Please have a fun and safe visit. Be courteous and respectful to others and please keep the park clean. And the people who put up the sign is the city of department parks, recreation and neighborhood services. It is a park. Ryan Lee. Yes, I think um, everyone can hear me. Yes. Th this location on Nobo, it is about two miles away from ATV station and any convenience store. So this is not an ideal location, definitely for the homeless folks. I have full compassion to them. However, this, and I see like uh, advocates for uh, homeless people, they go against this location as well. And also um, when bad things happen, when tragedy happened, as the district two councilman already mentioned, that was not his original intention, right? You don't worry about the case safety you worry about that there is a now recall rally. You don't worry about the people. You worry about you're holding on the power. Earn trust, you also mentioned that. Trust is hard to earn, but easy to lose. Think about the people. Hear us, hear the voice today. No shelter in District 4 on Noble Avenue. Blair Beekman. <laughs> All right, we're been here. I didn't know that I would be at public comment time so soon. Thank you. I'm in, in the middle of eating a corn chip or tortilla chip. Uh, thanks for the meeting today. Uh, I just wanted to remind the importance of, uh, you know, as we're dealing with abortion issues at this time, uh, state by state, good luck how uh, we can make women's uh, choices really clear for ourselves and how we talk about uh, new abortion issues, um, it's important that women aren't hurt in the future. And, and, and so it, it's important that we talk about available choices that we can still have that we're entering and hopefully we can be exiting sometime very soon. And from that, just an overall good luck to ourselves in open democratic practices and, and public policies towards the future of real positive community sustainability and ideas of peace, not war and harm. Thanks. Frank Wu, go ahead. Site selection criteria is highly questionable. How can community believe the site was selected from 140 sites and it is the best option? It is, is that because the literary city already on the land and it is the easy solution instead of the best solution? This closer site selection process and ranking criteria is critical. Building tiny site next to elementary school is totally unsec uh, unacceptable. How can we use the uh, assure the safety of our kids with just one block away from the 100 tiny side? Plus, 100 tiny side was built on 2.5 acre of land is at high density, high density. Being added that to the current community could increase the fire hazard, raising the security concern. 
Plus, the selection process was lack of communication to the community by forcing this decision without the community's involvement will just tear off the trust part. Lastly, okay. Lastly, I want to urge the city officials to listen in the voice of the community, rebuild the trust, open the chain of communication. City council should build the community, not the dividing. She'll solve the problem, not the creating more. Thank you. you. All Catherine Hedges. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, it seems, you know, you've heard a lot of comments about the noble site for the tiny homes. The community doesn't want it. Um, and the homeless advocates don't want it either because there is no transportation, there is no uh, services, there is no shopping. Uh, people are going to have to walk or bike from the tiny home community a long distance to get whatever they need. And guess what? They're going to be walking by the schools. People are going to be, oh my God, look at that person walking by the school. They must be up to something wrong and call the police. Some people are just trying to get where they need to go. It's just not a good situation. It's, you know, we shouldn't put the park there. We shouldn't put them at the park. Nobody wants them there. It's just going to be trouble if we use that site. And we need to hold Home First accountable for not going out in the field. Thank you. Bye, Ying. Hello, my name is Haiying. I'm a working mom, um, and I have been living in Barayasa area for more than 20 years. And I also, like, I work every day. I pay taxes, and I was, you know, try to have a house here safely and comfortably, and oh, hopefully my kids have a safe life, right? Like, you know, you don't expect, uh, like, you know, people like that to be their role model, right? So now if I have to worry about my kids' safety, I have to stay home. Who is going to pay the tax to support this program? And there are, as all people said here already, we have three schools nearby and we have one daycare and we also have library. So please, please reconsider your choices. And this happened five years ago. I mean, the choice has already been, the decision has been already made. I don't know why this happened again. Thank you. Jean Adams. Jean Adams, go ahead. Uh, yes, my, my question was going to be on something totally different, but just listening to this entire meeting and what you're planning on doing with tiny houses in communities where there's all kinds of schools has taken precedent over what I had to say. I am d disgusted with it all. And I think it's time that ballots started going out to the people, mail out ballots to have the, let the people vote and not just a handful of people in a room. We need to vote on everything first and get your, some input. You need some input from the people first. Thank you. Robert Aguirre. I'm back. Uh, I just want to say that, um, first of all, I, I would appreciate it if we went back to calling them unhoused rather than homeless. It shows a lot more respect. Uh, I'd also like to see more representation of people with lived experience making more of these decisions. I would also like to thank you and the housing department, even though you're not here, uh, for your um, courage to move forward with finding places for people to live that have no place to live now. Um, I challenge all the people to come up here and complain about being a half a mile away from some school or some other park or whatever. You can't find a place in the city that you're not a half a mile away from something. So no matter where you go, this is an, an, a NIMBY type of attitude that, oh yes, we wanna help the unhoused. We really wanna do this for them, but not in my backyard. And I think this is a brave move by the city to move forward. We have been living with this problem for so many years. We had 250 deaths last year. The numbers are growing. 
even though we are housing people, we're not housing them quickly enough and we're not housing enough people. And so any movement that is going towards helping people get off the street is a good movement. And just because you're across the street from a, an elementary school doesn't mean that you're a criminal. Um, Dazi Chen. Wait, I, I, wait, the person online, please pause. I don't want members of the public yelling at other speakers. Yeah, but anyone who, who speaks time. to another speaker will be uh, removed. Yes, let everybody have their time. Thank you. Um, go ahead. Okay, I hope you can hear me. So yeah. I live about 10 houses down from the Prospect, Prospect Avenue location. I've got three kids under six, two of whom go to a uh, preschool the other side of the Prospect Avenue location. So if we walk, you know, that's the, we walk on Prospect Avenue to get to school. Um, but I'm for this project. Uh, I'm 100% for it. There's just no good locations, like the previous um, speaker said. You know, uh, everything is next to something. And I, every location is gonna be in someone's backyard and I welcome it to be in my backyard. Thank you. Yang Zi. Yeah, I'm against the building the uh, transition housing besides the Noble Elementary School. There should be a minimum distance between any homeless site and uh, a school, not to mention there are actually three schools and uh, daycare. Secondly, I think the policy making decision is not transparent. Yeah, all my neighbors learned about this last week and no one from the city ever tried to have a conversation with local residents. Certainly, I think there might be more efficient ways to help the homeless people. Yeah, so for example, the city has been encouraging ADUs. So instead of like spending the money on such temporary housing, you can help people to build ADUs to house the people. And they have to kind of like uh, provide them to homeless folks. This would be a way more efficient approach. Yeah, thank you. Sam? Council member, thank you. Thank you for having me here. While I have you here, I would like to present myself. I'm Sam, and I live close to the proposed site where you are planning to put new tiny homes um, on, on Noble. I have a less than a five-year-old daughter, which is right now. We go out places. We, it's, a, it's a nice neighborhood. We, we walk around the park. There are percolation ponds next to it. It's a beautiful site to saw. Over the period of years, the residents of this place have really made it a good place for people to hang around and stay there. And we would want, honestly would want, some of the people who are, like, let's call it unhoused, as, as uh, other member mentioned, we would want to do something for them. But however, this location seems absolutely and totally a wrong location. Because it's one just, it's just across the street where the children of Noble Elementary are playing day in, day out. It's, it, and sometimes the gates are also open. Second point, the percolation ponds are just be, besides it. There is a good chance that, that, that probably an uh, unhoused person who just walks out for the night can fall into the percolation ponds. There are also, these possibilities are there. There are no convenience stores next to it. You would need at least a bike or at least something to go to thank the you. closest place to come. Timothy Ch thank you, Nick. Timothy Chu. Hi, my name is Timothy Chu, and I'm a resident of uh, I'm a resident of San Jose, West San Jose, uh, here to talk about the prospect site. My main concern is that uh, why was the public hearing scheduled about five to six months after the vote if the city council was serious about soliciting neighborhood input? And I would like to echo the concerns about schools, um, shopping areas, daycares, and so forth. But primarily, my main question is, if the city council was serious about seeking community input, why is the public hearing taking place five months after the vote instead of five months before the vote? Thank you. 
G. Hi, this is she. Uh, I'm living in the same area near Lobo. And um, when I look at the, the, the site you choose, I'm, I'm feel pretty funny because this site is very far from every, any uh, very like, convenient place. You guys have a car, you can drive to anywhere in several minutes, but for the homeless, how do you expect them to go to the other places? And also, and uh, this place is very far away from any police station. If anything happened to the to the people near that uh, the homeless center, how would the the police react quickly? And uh, when, today, when I look at your like expense, I was shocked how much money you spend on this project as temporary project. So we need to make when you spend money, please be very transparent to the taxpayers. Thank you. John, go ahead. Hi, Mr. Mayor, hi, the council, hi, everybody. Uh, I just have the questions. As the city prepares this shelter for the homeless, could you please describe the future residents in these locations? Are they healthy? Are they disease free? Are they drugs free? Are they high conscious in high agents? If they are not, do you think that, <clears throat> sorry, do you think that we can be confident to place them in the setting next to the children because the location is just right across the street from the schools? That is my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Carl Gordino. Good evening, Mayor Licardo and members of the council. I'm calling in tonight on a completely different item. Uh, this Saturday, July 2nd, we have an opportunity to once again support and celebrate our frontline hospital and healthcare workers through our second annual Stars and Strides Community Run and Walk in Discovery Meadow in downtown San Jose. We'd like to invite all of you to participate as we have a rather audacious goal to raise and donate $350,000 to the VMC Foundation as they support three county hospitals, 14 healthcare clinics, and 1 million primarily underserved people throughout our community on an annual basis. We hope you'll consider joining us and signing up, encouraging your communities to do so at starsandstridesrun.com. And I thank you all for your service. Amadeus. Amadeus, you're still muted. Okay, I'm gonna move on to Min Min Lee. Um, I'm Min Min Lee, thank you to give me the chance. I want to share a story that actually happened in my hometown. One homeless, he is well, well educated, looked a good manner, but he broke into an elementary school and, and killed two kids. No one expected that will happen, and no one wants this happen. In my hometown, all the campus are closed and guarded by safety guard, but two kids still be killed. I'm not here to say that if the tiny home located in Prospect and the 85 Highway will make this happen, but I really be afraid that happened to our kids. I think you, all the board members should be, have kids in, in your homes. You, you both care your kids and also care our kids. So please reconsider the selection of the site. Other reasons I want to say no to the tiny house is just how to use the resource effectively. I understand that there's over- Blue Hills parent. Yeah, hey, mayor and the council member, uh, thank you for listening to the public opinion. Uh, so far, I think the message from the public is loud and clear. Keep the tiny homes away from schools. 
my husband and I are, we have school a child belonging to Blue Hill Elementary. We strongly approached the site near Prospect in 85. Um, the safety and, you know, and safety and security of our child is our top priority. While we understand the need for more homes and uh, have, you know, compassion and empathy for the less fortunate, but uh, please may, do not make our security and safety of the child as a trade-off. That's a trade-off we cannot make. Thank you. Amelia? Amelia? No, I'm fine. I'm just listening. Thank you. Ken Chan? Hello. Um, can you hear me? Yes. All right, wonderful. Hello. Uh, I'm a community member from around the Noble site, and I'm here today to support all of the proposed tiny homes locations because they'll give our residents the benefits of having a space to sleep and to begin work towards permanent homes. The systems we have in place will only help if someone has been unhoused for 18 months. And a lot of our unhoused community members were stably housed at some point, and they have lived in San Jose for so much longer. They've gone to uh, or have children who are still attending our local schools and they continue to work and shop throughout our city. They've been here and they're our community members. Look, you can't plan for the future if you're dreading your tomorrow. And these homes have the potential to alleviate folks of that stress and to give them the, mu give them the much needed proverbial bootstraps to lift themselves up and to begin work towards finding stable homes. Thank you. Tina Lamb. Hi, this is Tina Lam. I'm a resident of San Jose. Um, I want to say that for any kind of development project, it still has to be governed by the general plan and then the CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act. And then the noble site is in violation of both. So the city, even as much as we care about the unhoused and want to do right by them, this is the wrong choice. I want to ask your staff to please fact check it really pick a different site so that we can really help them instead of embroidering in all these community dispute because it simply is the wrong site. Ivan Liu. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, hi, my name is Ivan. Um, I would like to highlight uh, the impacts of this bigger scope on this site on Noble Avenue. Because first, as many people already pointed out, this site is just a crossroad of elementary school. So it will impact the parents who is from a bigger dis school district. They have to send their kids to this, uh, to this school. Second, the site is exactly besides the Dr. Robert Gross ponds. These ponds actually are part of the valley water purification system. The ponds will preserve in the field of water that will be later used for drinking by people from the city. So building crowded tiny homes will lead to potential environmental problems like water contamination and pollution. I think this means the site choice also impacts way more people from the city who use the water resource too. So I hope the city mayor and the council will consider fairly and thoroughly about this choice. Thank you. Build the homes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to come in to say that someone earlier had said there were already unhoused people in the park. And would you rather have them wandering around with no help or have them in these tiny homes that actually have, you know, support systems and security and guidelines for residency and will give them food and job placement and mental health counseling to keep it more safe for your kids, which is apparently your main concern. So it really doesn't make any sense to reject these houses when they are, the, the unhoused people are already there. If you haven't had problems yet, you will have even fewer problems with the tiny homes there for them to live in and feel more secure themselves. Thank you. Junxia Ma. Hi, um, thank you for giving me the chance. Um, I echo the safety concern, um, uh, like building the tiny home against the Nobel Library, because I live in Bariasa um, area for 10 years. 
uh, in a corner lot. And the recent year, there is a homeless person always wandering on a street. He just uh, like uh, release himself in the um, walkway and uh, leave a lot of trash and take drugs and yelling to the air and uh, scare the kids on the street. It's really a safety concern to having the like homeless people around the elementary school. For those, I, I, I understand, like, uh, I also welcome the idea, like, put those homeless uh, people in a uh, residential, uh, in a house, but not near the children, because uh, even if we care for the homeless, we also need to take care of our kids. Uh, our kids, uh, we shouldn't, like, sacrifice our case safety to just uh, like uh, solve another problem. Uh, we can find a better solution, but... Paul Miyoshi? Paul Miyoshi? Okay, classism is the new racism. I would like all the people in the chambers to take a look around. 155 of the people who died on the streets last year were people of color. People who died on the streets last year, there were two babies. Two babies have already died on the streets this year. The majority of the people who died on the streets last year, 155 of them were also seniors. So far, the majority of the people who have died on the streets this year are seniors. The majority of the people in the chambers today are seniors, people over 50 years old. When you push projects like this out of areas and make them take longer, you are killing people. There's nothing else you can say except, I don't want somebody here. And in the time it takes to find somebody out some other place, you are killing people. And I cannot believe that a group of people who are majority people of color are such classist bigots. Sarah? 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 Hello, um, this is Sarah. I just want to mention something real quick for this side, why I post this site. First of all, the selection of the site shows Asian discrimination. We found that the two select sites in residential area, both 90, around 90% 90 one in West San Jose. It's obvious that our mayor and the council members think Asian community is low key and really does not make waves. So they could just bully us. And another thing is that the current site selection process was done without notifying the local community. So it's a violation of Brown Act. Please check what's the penalties for a violation of the Brown Act. Please Google it, uh, our officials. Hi, Ying. This is Haiying. Um, so I want to say, um, you know, echo what uh, the previous uh, speaker said. The community, like we have, a, like majority of us are Asians. Is it like a discrimination? Um, and also the, the lady said it's because of the color. That's why we, uh, we don't support the homeless people or unhoused people. I can tell you that we support the unhoused people, but we also couldn't sacrifice our kids' safety. And I work for half a safe house, for, for half a safe house, and I work really hard also for my kids' safety. Please reconsider the choice at the noble side. Thank you. Francisco. Francisco. Yeah. My name is Francisco Paras, and uh, I also live in the area where the proposed site is going to be built. And I just want to say it's totally inappropriate to put that in your agenda because uh, it's surrounded by schools, library, and children are always present. So hopefully the council and the mayor make a better decision and looking for a better location. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. 
Oh, hello, city council members. I'm Tuki's mom, living in Prospect and uh, 85 highs at six. Uh, there are 586 uh, members uh, resident in this area are against the tiny home. Um, uh, there, um, the set, uh, uh, set six is not make any sense. It can help 30 and home the person, but will harm all the community, hundreds of families and thousands of people who live in prospect community. There are at least 40 schools, daycares, and education centers nearby. Besides uh, seven libraries, parks, and tennis court, uh, there are playgrounds for children here. Parents play with their children, exercise, and relax. Please help protect the kids from not suffering from any unnecessary danger. Thank you. Li Hong. Hi, my name is Zhi Hong Huang. Um, I live in, near the Prospect community. And when I heard the news uh, the last week from Mercury News, I was completely shocked. And how could this decision is made without communicating with our, our local community? And um, near the, uh, the location, there are so many schools and daycares. I sent to my kid, uh, my son, to study um, near the location. And he sometimes walk around and play. And my, my kids also walk to school. And by building those buildings, uh, I don't feel safe anymore to have them walk by themselves. And it's a threatening to our uh, sense of security to live in this community and at the trust to the city councils. Tony Chow. Hi, um, this is your friend Tony Chow's wife. Um, I grew up in San Jose. I lived in a noble uh, community. And you know, as part of growing up, I have the privilege to be able to play outside, play on the street, bike, you know, however, you know, as days go on, how expensive it is to live in, in, in this area. The homeless will not go away, it will continue to grow. Please look into that. You know, at the same time, I don't want my kids' privileges to be taken away, the freedom to be able to walk outside, um, the freedom to go to parks and playground would interfere, and also give them a future. Uh, view of themselves that, you know, one day they may be able to live in one of those tiny homes and be in required shelter because of how expensive it is to live here. You know, I, I will like them to have a future, you know, the kids experience the playfulness uh, that we used to do when we we're a kid one time. Please don't take that away from them. Thank you. Sorry. Hi. Hi. Uh, hi. This is Sai. Uh, that uh, this is uh, I have concern about uh, tiny homes about uh, uh, closer to Noble Elementary School, uh, which is not the right place to establish. But uh, you people are uh, councillor and city councillor are wasting a lot of time for the other people uh, by putting this one into agenda. It will not go. Uh, anyhow, it will not happen, and you are putting, you are wasting the uh, city's money, and you are wasting the time of the people, valuable time of the people. New Ho. Amelia. Okay, I have, here's what I was hearing through this whole entire session. I understand everybody has a vote. I want to commend the, com the council because they've done an exceptional position tonight doing this special housing event. I want to also irritate to the, I, I, if I need to separate and singular sing you out, I will. Here's what I'd like to say to the Asian culture in general. Each of us has an opportunity to get things done. 
we are sending out ballots. We are informing the city. We are telling you to be invited. You made an option not to make that choice. Now we may, we had to vote with you five year, without you five years ago. Today we revoted. Here you are. I've heard several remarks incriminating the homeless. You haven't given them an opportunity. You call them different people, wandering people. You call them homeless people. You've made so many remarks. Let's not do that. I've been beaten by your Asian culture. So let's please be respectful to all culturism. Michael Chang. Hi, my name is Michael Chang. I'm a neighbor around Noble. Uh, so I understand the concern that people have and you know, this, there is a homeless crisis that we are trying to face, but I think this project is not really the right solution that we need to approach right now, mostly because it's really a non-viable site that's being selected. It doesn't address the parking requirement, transit, and it's not near any city services. Overall, if we're trying to help the homeless, this does not help the homeless, and it's going to cause them more harm by separating them from anything that they actually need. So we do need to look at that, and we also have to address the question whether this meets a CEQA requirements. And at this time, this is a developed open space, so it's not going to be an easy site to develop. We need to come to an easier, more proactive solution that's going to use existing sites that would make more sense to house the homeless on existing projects that have housing already instead of on fair ground. Are you? Hello, everyone. Um, I think all of, us, all of us are having a kind heart. We try to be supportive, but the, as simple as Noble Avenue, uh, it's not a right solution for it. It has been validated five years ago, and I don't think we need to validate it again. And there are three schools nearby, and there are daycare, and there are lots of seniors. They couldn't attend, even be able to attend this meeting. So please, not only taking care of the unhoused people, also taking care of the community. And I think our councilman, um, you know, David Cohen already voted no to it. So please reconsider. Thank you. Adopt. Adawa. Hi, uh, my name is Adwaya. Uh, I am the resident of Beriasa. Uh, I am not being a classist. My only concern is safety. Uh, to be frank, the current community that I stay, we have so many thefts every day. We have even complained the, to the police, but nothing has been taken care of. And every day we still have thefts. The, we have a park that was told that it will be opened in last December, but it has been not opened yet by the city councils because they are planning to come up with an, another uh, affordable housing community nearby. We have needles and drugs going around, and anytime we give a complaint about this, nothing happens. So my only concern is safety. Who will take guarantee that no drugs or theft will occur? And how can you give us assurance on this one? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hello. First, uh, uh, thank uh, all the uh, people who speak uh, against uh, the tiny home uh, at Noble uh, Elementary. I mean, near Noble Elementary School. I have two two kids, nine years old and six years old. Both the um, attend Noble School and they enjoy the studying. They're studying their life there. So I cannot imagine if we have a tiny. Um, home built there, and how how can I? I mean, I won't I won't be uh, re, um I won't I won't be relieved to stay at home and uh, um I mean sure I, I make sure and they are safe at their school near. I mean, if they have any chance, has to walk uh, near their school to go to uh, some uh, day trip uh, uh, near the park or or, or etc. I will be worried all, all day and uh, not have any second of relief. So uh, if that happened, I have to say, yeah, before there's a speaker um, saying, uh, what about the, what, the, uh, what about the uh, future for the resident? Charles G. Also, I do have people who are putting their hands up a second time. Um, if you, if I already called you, I'm not going to call you again. Um, go ahead, Charles. All right, thanks. Um, my name is Charles. I'm a resident um, of Barreza community. So I live very close to Noble Elementary School. 
And I have one question and two suggestions to the mayor and the council members. So the first, the question is that um, the site has been proposed five years ago and it was deemed not viable. And so why does it come back again and become one of the, the top sites uh, in the short list? And my suggestion is that we should look for other locations which can provide better communication, better, um, easier uh, for, for them to commute to, for job and the food so that um, they can make their life uh, with respect and dignity. And the second suggestion is that um, actually um, five years ago, Gene S. Hi, so I just wanna first say thank you so very much council members um, for allowing us to all come in. Um, I actually disagree with everyone. I am very happy that this, um, you guys are putting tiny homes in homeless people um, and house because you know some of these people that are here, they're not putting their feet in homeless people's shoes. You know, there's been, a lot of um, it's and you know the crime doesn't always come from the homelessness. We don't always we don't we don't all do drugs. You know I'm homeless and I don't do drugs. I'm I have never done drugs and I don't even drink. So I think that you guys are doing very very well. I'm so proud of you guys and I'm really and I really hope this pa I I'm really grateful that you guys um, put this in passing and um, I just I'm, I cannot be honored to be here on this call and so happy that you guys are actually helping the homeless. So thank you so very much. Okay, I'm going back to council. A lot of people who already spoke are raising their hands. Um, it looks to me like I've called everybody, so I'm going back to council. Okay, well, thanks to all the members of the community who came in person and online to speak. Um, but unfortunately, this is not Chicago. You can only vote one. So uh, we're now supposed to adjourn the meeting for five minutes, is that right? Yes, um, so- I'll Okay. So everybody, we're adjourning the meeting. We'll come back in five minutes to take up item, uh, the item on the public hearing and local homelessness action plan. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, and that is a special meeting. The special meetings are not required to have open forum, so there is no open forum on the special meeting. Only speakers who are going to speak on the topic will be heard. Amen.